Prime Minister Justin Trudeau recently attended the G7 summit and it appears that he may have ignored many of the COVID-19 protocols in place right here in Canada. To discuss this in more detail is political reporter Brian Lilly. Now, Fox News, Brian, was making fun of our Prime Minister, saying he had the mask on, then it was off, then it was on again. What gives? Well, if he was meeting world leaders with official photographers in front of him, then the mask was on. If it was a, a candid moment at a garden party where everyone was jammed in close together, the mask was off. It was all a little weird, how? Because Justin Trudeau is one of these leaders that, of course, is saying that we need to keep restrictions in place. He set the bar higher than any province has. He's, you know, we're seeing reopenings happening in every single part of the country right now, and none of the provincial premiers have set the bar as high as the federal government wants it to be. Why? They're dealing with reality. He's off in his own world with Dr. Tam. But when he's in the UK, which is currently having a resurgence of COVID-19 cases due to the B1617 slash Indian slash Delta variant, well, then it's masks off. I mean, the UK, during the G7 summit, the UK announced that they were extending for another four weeks before they lift the final restrictions. They were supposed to uh, release those, uh, well, this coming weekend. Instead, they're going until July 19th. But to our prime minister, it didn't matter. To the other world leaders, it didn't matter. And, and it's got an awful lot of people saying, well, wait a minute. If it's okay for you to be like that, why can't I be like that? Why, why can't I doff the mask? Why can't I be a, a, at a crowded party, at a crowded restaurant, in, um, you know, on a patio? What have you? Whatever the case may be where your restrictions are, it's making an awful lot of people sit up and say, Hmm, he's not following his own rules. So, Brian, while people were taking pot shots at our Prime Minister, our PM also took a recent shot at newspaper journalists and it had something to do with fish? This, this was just a bizarre comment. He was talking about all the things that they had talked about, the important issues, and, you know, talking about uh, how to deal with the COVID-19 pandemic around the world, talking about climate change, talking about all these big global issues that were on the table at the G7 and said uh, something to the effect of, you know, we'll be dealing with this long after the newspapers you write for are used to wrap fish. What? Find me a chippy or a fishmonger that still wraps fish in newspaper. Um, you know, I, I, I do go to an actual fish place uh, now and again to, to get some fresh fish. And, and guess what? They don't use newspaper, Hal. And, and even in the UK, I'm not sure that the fish and chip joints are using newspapers anymore. You're not going into a chippy and getting your... Uh, your your carryout wrapped up in a yesterday's edition of the Daily Mail. Uh, the prime minister obviously realized he'd stepped in it, and when he was asked to repeat in French, he said, uh, "Maybe I'll skip that part about newspapers and fish. I, I don't want to get myself in any more trouble." Now, Brian, a big topic of discussion here in Alberta is the referendum on equalization, but federal leaders say they don't want to get involved. Not even Jason Kenney's buddy, Conservative leader Aaron O'Toole. No, none of them do. And, you know, you look at O'Toole's comments and then you look at what, uh, I was about to call him Prime Minister, uh, Premier Jason Kenney, what he had to say. And, and Kenney said, I don't expect federal leaders to get involved. O'Toole's comments were to the effect of, this is for Albertans to decide. And he very much realizes that he's an outsider. Aaron O'Toole is an Ontario boy. He's got some deep connections to uh, Atlantic Canada due to his time in the military, due to family connections, but he is not an Albertan. And he said that this referendum on equalization and what should be done about equalization should be decided by Albertans. You know, I'll, I'll say that's better than his position and the position of the Prime Minister and Jagmeet Singh when it comes to uh, Quebec's bill that tramples all over language rights or Quebec's bill that tramples all over the rights of religious minority. I'm talking about bills 21 and 96 here. In those cases, you know, we're, we're talking about fundamental freedoms being trampled on and all of the leaders are, oh, well, we don't want to talk too much about Quebec. In this case, I actually understand where they're coming from. And Premier Kenny said he doesn't expect nor want federal leaders jumping in on this debate. We know that the 
conservatives were, would be more likely to lean towards Alberta's side, but the liberals we know would lean towards the side of always give Quebec more money. Not that the Tories were much better in power, but they're a little bit better than the Liberals on this. Now, speaking of Quebec, and you touched on this a little bit here, the Liberal government introduced legislation this week to strengthen the protection of French in Canada as part of the biggest overhaul to the Official Languages Act in, what, more than three decades? So, Brian, what does that mean for us here in English-speaking Canada? It means more French, more French, more French. Look, I, 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 am, I am very aware of the French fact in Canada. Whether we're talking about the almost 25% of the population who is mostly French-speaking that lives in Quebec, the strong uh, presence of French in eastern Ontario, northern Ontario, parts of Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and Alberta, you know, up around uh, some of the areas outside of uh, Edmonton, there's still strong French-speaking communities. And I absolutely understand that. But one thing that I learned shortly after getting onto Parliament Hill in around 2005, Hal, is the, the Official Languages Committee and the Official Languages Act have nothing to do with promoting or protecting English anywhere in the country, including in Quebec, and that the committee's only, only reason for existence is to promote French everywhere. And so they've introduced this new bill, Bill 32, it will recognize that French is the official language of Quebec, that New Brunswick is officially bilingual, and then the rest of the bill is about strengthening French across the rest of the country. In some places, like Eastern Ontario, like Northern Ontario, like parts of Alberta and Saskatchewan, this makes sense. In other areas, it doesn't. The federal government campaigned against the Ford government here in Ontario to get a, another French university in Toronto. There are not enough students here to support that, but we're going to pay for it and we're going to do it. So if you want a concrete example of what this bill will accomplish, it will be white elephant projects like a French university in downtown Toronto that will not be able to attract students. In fact, I, I believe it's only several dozen that applied for the first year of this school. A new report says the Canada Border Services Agency confirmed it is opening an office of biometrics and will use computer chips, Brian, embedded in new passports to track every citizen who travels outside of Canada. Is that not a major infringement on our rights? Here's the good news, Hal. They can't do it. Not yet. They don't have the technology, even if they wanted to, even if Parliament gave them the power. Because in, in order to be able to track you, they need to know that you left the country. They don't have exit data right now. You leave the country, you go drive across the border, the United States, you get on a plane, you fly anywhere in the world. They don't know that you've left the country because they don't have the ability to track that. The United States has a bit more of that ability for its citizens, but we simply don't have that ability. And we're talking about something that will potentially start taking place in around 2028, but was approved for experimentation several years ago. So this is going to be a long time before it comes. There's a lot of time for people to be able to push back and say, you know what, I'm not comfortable with this. You know, there have been the option of what's called e-passports for a long time now, in that you could choose to have a biometric electronic passport. It costs more, there's a bit more involved in it, and that's your choice. And if you want to make that your choice, all the more power to you. Have at it. But for those of us that say, mm, I'm not comfortable with this idea, then you should be able to have another option. So if you don't like it, lobby your MP, lobby Parliament, say this isn't a good idea. But also in the meantime, when your passport comes up for renewal, which mine does very soon, renew for 10 years. The U.S. Department of Transportation is seeking a $25.5 million U.S. penalty against Air Canada for failing to provide consumers with prompt refunds after cancelling their flights amid the COVID-19 pandemic. Brian, the agency said it received thousands of refund complaints since March of last year. Yeah, more than 6,000 refund complaints from Americans, Hal. So this is not, uh, you know, imagine how many refund complaints there have been from Canadians. And I've been hearing about this since the beginning. Why? My brother's one of the complainers, <laughs> one of the people who's saying, hey, where's my money? Air Canada, you took my money. You took my money for the flight. Now, the, the airline has simply been saying, due to everything else going on, they can't refund everybody. And in fact, they have only refunded 
a portion of the Canadian customers that they have. So Air Canada says that they're going to fight this, that the United States is uh, being a bit too aggressive and not understanding, but interesting that the American government is going after Air Canada before they go after, uh, before the Canadian government does. Uh, now there was a $5.9 billion bailout a little while ago. Less than half of that money has been returned to Canadians in, in terms of refunds, both for those who, I, I will grant the airline this, there were people that had refundable tickets and they got their money earlier, but they've also given out more than a billion dollars, I think it's $1.4 billion, for people that did not buy refundable tickets. And now you're maybe thinking, hmm, that travel insurance that I always say no to. Maybe next time I want to say yes. Yeah, it'd definitely be a good idea, you bet. Major General Danny Fortin is asking for a judicial review of the decision to remove him as the head of Canada's vaccine logistics. He alleges political interference by Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and not one, but two of his cabinet ministers. Yeah, those two other cabinet ministers are Health Minister Patty Haidu and Defence Minister Harjit Sejan. The reason for that is Danny Fortin, as a member of the military, would eventually report up to Harjit Sejan, the Defence Minister, but he was seconded over to the Public Health Agency of Canada, which is under the purview of Health Minister Patty Haidu. So he was removed, and he says that in addition to political interference, there was it was procedurally unfair what happened. And I would say that he has a case here. I'll tell you why, Hal. Because Danny Fortin was removed from his post and not told why, not told what the allegation against him was until a reporter from a TV network called him at his home days later and said, so what do you have to say about this allegation? And he knew nothing until then, it's also an allegation that's more more than 30 years old. Um, that That is not an excuse, but you need to actually follow procedural fairness when you're uh, dealing with a case like this. I would say that at least there was no procedural fairness. Whether there was political interference, we'll leave that up to, uh, to the courts to decide, but that's going on right now. Another black eye for the military on this file. Brian, you've looked at the numbers and you say that it was a good thing the Trudeau Liberals did not seek a spring election because it may have ended badly for them. Tell me more. Yeah, well, you you know that for months, Hal, I said, oh, yeah, we're going to have a spring election and election day will be June 7th or June 14th. That's what I kept saying, that, uh, you know, the, the COVID numbers would stay down, the vaccine rollout would happen, then they bring in a big spending budget. Well, they brought in the big spending budget. That went nowhere. It didn't help them at all. Uh, the vaccine rollout, especially through February and really into March, was very spotty, and the COVID numbers took off. We had the third wave. So all of those reasons, the Trudeau Liberals didn't bite. But now we're looking at 33% saying they would vote for the Liberals in several polls. We're talking about Leger, Angus Reid, uh, Abacus Data. Major pollsters are saying that it's 33% for the Liberals, 30% for the Conservatives. Now, when you consider that that's top heavy for Atlantic Canada and Quebec, and then according to different pollsters, you know, Leger and Angus Reid, they've fallen dramatically in Ontario. That does not leave them an awful lot of room for a majority at this point. Things can change, campaigns matter. But it is very different. Aaron O'Toole is not out of this race. Aaron O'Toole and the Conservatives are still very much in this race. And when you consider all the bad headlines about Jason Kenney in Alberta and how badly he's doing and voters are upset or Doug Ford in Ontario, both of them polling in their provinces show that they are ahead of where Justin Trudeau and the Liberals are. You wouldn't know it from the reporting, though, would you, Hal? That's true. Very true. Political reporter Brian Lilly, thanks again for joining me today from Toronto. Thank you, Hal.